My name is John Smith. We're about to watch the Rugby World Cup final of 2007 on the 20th of October in Paris, of which I was the captain of the South African side who fortunately snuck in a win to take the trophy back home. This, quite emotionally, is the first time that I'll be watching the game since this actual date, so it's pretty surreal. I'm not quite sure how it's going to go. It's one of those things that always has felt more of a sort of dream than anything else, so sitting down and watching it for the first time is uh, hopefully going to be enjoyable. We've got this WhatsApp group that's been going for a couple of years. The guys stay in touch and uh, every now and again we uh, share a bit of information about what's happening. So I've just sent them a message saying that I'm sitting down for the first time to watch the actual game. We got into this tournament in pretty good shape, both physically and mentally in terms of how we were playing and, and, and how we were poised. We knew we had a, a pretty solid chance of, 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 of getting through to the end. You know, we'd spoken about this moment four years before, because when we started with Jake in 2004, he sat in our first team meeting in Bloemfontein and said, guys, in four years' time, we're going to have the William Webelis Trophy in our change room in Paris. And so we'd now put ourselves into a position to get there, so uh, we needed to just be consistent. The day itself wasn't that consistent because our president had flown in to wish us luck on Saturday morning. So I had to wake up the whole squad a little bit earlier to get, uh, to get down to the, the team room to have Thabo Mbeki wish us well, which was incredible. And that was about the only thing that went out of sync. Everything else worked out exactly the same way. We had, I mean, that guy in screen now, Osterant, he was like the sort of father figure of the team. He'd come in as an old dog and he just, he set the tone for everything. You know, he's one of those players when you're getting around in a change room and there's that sort of that coldness, that, that, in, that, that sort of vibe that's sort of settled in and you know, you sort of hoping that everyone else is feeling pretty good. But you're doing your shoelace and you look across and you say, okay, well, Austin Runs, yeah, I think we're going to be okay. You know, he's been there before. And um, at that stage, we were quite a collective team. We, we, we had become so close and so tight that we knew exactly who needed to be able to listen to music on the bus, who needed it quiet, what uh, music we played. And as the bus arrived, we would always have one song that played, you know, and, uh, and it sort of, it was the tone that got us into the mood for being in the, in the stadium and then getting through our own personal routines. And we were quite, by that stage, quite a mature team that we had a, a good 45 to an hour beforehand and the, the halfbacks would go out and get their kicking done. The back three would practice their, their, their up and unders. Uh, I would go out and throw um, quite a few balls and, and everyone did their own thing and we would always come together for 18 minutes and that routine we could have done in our sleep and it just went as smoothly as ever. An 18 minute warm up um, before we headed back into the change room. So um, we try to keep things as consistent as possible uh, and we also we knew we had a, a significant challenge ahead of us with a team that had sort of resurrected its World Cup uh, through the power of the players. I always called heads and then I used to change up and tails never fails but that also didn't always work for me either. <laughs> This time it didn't work again, so I had to wait for Phil to make the call. This interaction is quite important because you get to feel out how nervous the other captain is, what his vibe is, you get a look in his eye, the referee as well, you get to see how composed he is and whether he's feeling the, the situation. But I, always, I liked to always kick off first. You know, if there wasn't any wind, um, I always liked to put the ball in their half and, and see what they come up with. You know? And then we would, we, would have, we would have scenarios for both. If a team quickly kicked out. If you took kick deep and they kicked out for the line out, you sort of knew that there was a nervousness about them and they just wanted to get that first phase out and then we would come with a very attacking line out. Um, if they went through two or three phases and had a go, it sort of showed a little bit more confidence and then when they eventually did kick out, we would probably put up a, a nice big drive and, and try to impose ourselves physically to create that nervousness um, going forward. I, I 
sometimes we'd do a lot of talking in a change room depending on what the mood was and I'd always get a feeling for what was going on and there were some test matches where I'd really have to get involved and I just didn't pick up enough of enough energy and I'd have to you know get going and and push a few buttons emotionally this day was co completely different to any other day in terms of me as a captain and, and what I felt I needed to do I literally didn't have to say a word you know we we had this this talk before we left South Africa about arriving in Paris as if we'd won the World Cup, which meant we had to behave like that, we had to train like that, and we had to play like that at all times. And we had done that. And so there was nothing left to do. We had put ourselves in this position. Everyone was very good at what they did. Everyone knew exactly what they did. And we had an unbelievably detailed plan about how we were going to get through this final hurdle. And there was nothing. We didn't have to, you know, smash each other up in the, ch in, the, in, the, in the change room. All we had to do was basically shake hands, give the, the usual hug that, uh, that, that, we, that connected us before a game. Say so, uh, we always got together beforehand in the change room and we'd always say a prayer and bless the, our team and the team we were playing against and the situation. And everything worked exactly that. And of all the team change rooms and the talks that I'd ever given, this was probably the day that I had to do the least. I can't think of any message that I, I needed to give these guys. In fact, there was such a quiet calm about my group that it gave me this, the ability in a long time to be able to just get myself into the kind of space that I wanted to be for, for an event like this. And it's quite daunting. You're standing here next, next to a, a, a team going into a World Cup final and it's, it's one moment that you've worked for for, for four years. You've, you've sacrificed a huge amount of time. You've been through a hell of a lot to get to this one moment and there's still 80 minutes between you and making four years worthwhile or coming second. I think that song became sort of um, part of your motivational ritual because when you heard the music it's quite powerful and it sort of it established the magnanimity of, of what we were doing playing in a World Cup which only comes around every four years. So, yeah, the music had a significant effect. I mean, even now, I was sitting in a hotel two, two days ago and the, 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 there was this piano playing on some automatic program and uh, it played it played this song. And uh, that feeling of exactly how I felt walking out of a tunnel just came about, came over me. So, yeah, it's, it's a pretty special song. Before the World Cup even starts, you get to choose your change rooms and uh, and who becomes the home team of the day. So with a game like this, we'd have to literally flip a coin to see who gets the home change room and then who stands where and who becomes the home team. So it's a luck of the draw, really. But this sort of this is probably one of my favourite moments. Uh, and if I miss anything about playing the game, I think it's this moment where you're standing with your sort of your teammates in front of thousands of people singing a national anthem, representing millions of people, and, uh, and you get that sort of goosebump feeling that comes over you. Um, it's hard to replicate moments like this in, in anything, really. Um, so, yeah, you, you, you're even more mo emotional because there's just that much more at stake. And it's not just another test match, it's, uh, it's, it's the test match that you've been working towards for four years. There were a few things that stuck out for me. I mean, we obviously knew that there would be a lot of English people able to come to the game. Um, we had a huge amount of support from the French. 
the uh, eternal hatred between the two nations seemed to work in our favour. But at the stadium, obviously, there was there was a, a huge amount of noise for England. And uh, the other thing that stood out for me, other than the crowd, was the body language of the English team. There was a lot of swaying and, and legs tapping, and the, you could see that they they were they were hell of a worked up. Um, and for me, the distinct difference was was between, between body language was that you know we had this other team that was pretty riled up and so my message you'll see when we sing the anthem we we always wear our, our tracksuit bottoms and we started doing the tracksuit bottoms because of the haka basically because of every time we played the all blacks the haka always seemed to be the last thing before we did it and it was such an enjoyable process but it was the, it was the last thing that you'd experience before the kickoff so i just decided that for us to fully enjoy the haka and then be able to re refocus, we had to have some of ritual of our own. So we just put on tracksuit bottoms and after the haka we then took our tracksuit bottoms off and it gave us a 15, 20 second period to collect, look each other in the eye and then reset for the kickoff. And, um, and here, what that opportunity gave us was when we eventually got together and got our tracksuit bottoms off and got together, I just said, said guys, you know, we know exactly what we've got to do. You've seen the body language, you've seen the eyes of the opponents. There's going to be 20 minutes of absorption that we've got to manage and get ourselves through. And uh, the next 20 will depend on how the full 80 goes. Um, because emotionally they were in a far different place to us. They were, you know, they, they needed a little bit of luck, in our opinion, and, and we needed to make sure that we controlled the game. And, and it's quite difficult when you've got a team that's sort of uh, uh, worked up and psyched up and it's important to be able to manage that into, into the first 20 minutes. So that little period of getting together and refocusing while we got sort of got up our tracky pants off was uh, pretty important. The stage is set, the two princes William and Harry are here in Stade de France tonight for the World Cup final. Alain Roland of Ireland has the pleasure of refereeing this final international of Rugby World Cup 2007. He was uh, without doubt the best referee at the time. The nice thing about him is that he was not intimidated by any one singular player. He's a strong character uh, and he liked to set the tone and put, you know, stamp his authority on the game, which I like. I, I'd rather have a very strong referee who doesn't try and please players. And uh, he was the perfect referee for this game because, you know, you wanted it to be about the rugby only and not about in influences. And, and, and to be fair, you know, I'd, I'd, had, I'd normally have a pretty good effect on referees and I'd, I'd certainly have a tactic on how to influence them. And But, you know, I, I didn't need to waste any time on, on Alain. He was steadfast in all things and I, and I knew that I'd get a consistency from him which is all we needed. Alan Roland, his 27th international, assisted tonight by Joel Jutka of France on the line as well as Paul Hannes from New Zealand. The awkward thing is, when that final whistle went, <laughs> he was the closest guy to me and I just hugged him as if he was a long lost brother. So he felt very awkward. It was like hugging a dead fish because uh, I don't think he thought it was the ideal scenario. So he couldn't get out of that hug fast enough. But anyway, I thought he had a, a great tournament and he was uh, the perfect referee for the final. Say ball. You're almost relieved when this happens because the build-up is massively tense. I mean, you've, you've now come from a, a press conference with all the whole team facing over 250 media, 50 cameras, something you've never experienced. The whole week in itself is just pressure. And then finally, when Johnny kicks off, we can get back to what you actually do for a living, which is, which is playing rugby. England, the defending champions, up against the champions of 12 years ago, South Africa. The final game is underway. Already taken by Scott Berger. At first, it is so crucial. The fact that it went straight to Skulk was a good sign because Skulk is just flat out all the time, still is. So that first hit was just so monstrous and um, the sort of calculated setup of Furi to Butchie and then back past the 10 yard, you know, it's how we played it. And we obviously put in a huge amount of work into the lineouts. Uh, we had two amazing lineout forwards with the Juan Smith. So we wanted to disrupt their lineouts as much as possible because Johnny was at his best off their lineouts. So we put a lot of effort into making sure that they got a lot of lineouts. We were quite happy for them to have lineouts and we wanted to make those lineouts 
as ugly as possible for the full 80. So yeah, the perfect start other than the knock-on from Donny. Now, what can uh, England conjure up from here? Two, you're there are the it's pack okay. weights, and uh, for once, England outweighed in the pack. Okay. And both okay. of the front rows are going to have to work incredibly hard. Sheridan, Reagan, and Vickery for England. And here was another issue, because they had a pretty solid scrum. Uh, and we knew we just had to keep parity here. We didn't really, you know, really want to waste too, too much time getting ascendancy. And the first scrum was just... Uh, uh, they just monstered us. You know? um, how we got away without <laughs> being penalised uh, was really because they just stopped. They had us on the coals and they just stopped. Um, and then so that was going to be the issue that we knew we'd have to manage for the rest of the game. Lineouts, we pretty much knew we'd have sussed, but we just had to keep them out from a scrum point of view. And then I think we may expect uh, a kick across field, but meanwhile, Backwards. the forwards go bludgeoning forward. Gummersall goes on the tight side again. So you couldn't think of a worse start to a test match. Kick the ball out, win their line out, then give the ball back in a scrum, get Masters in the scrum, and then they're going through the phases, smashing us in our own half. So uh, it did build our energy because we got a lot of energy out of defence and turnovers from defence. So when we managed to save the situation, it did sort of trigger some comfort zone stuff for us because you know, we, we used our defence and the ability to turn that ball over and absorb as a, as a pretty you know, big energy giver. Well, certainly going to be interesting this battle in the line out already. The score is 1 0 to South Africa. I think people sometimes forget just how much work goes into analysing opposition. You know, we had Victor, who obviously is, as an athlete, his aerial skills were second to none, but where he was really good was his attention to detail and the amount of work he put in. He would get as many feeds, uh, angles, audio files as possible and sit with these huge ear headphones and write down all their calls and then watch the game over and over again. Watch every line out, listen to the call and then slowly try and figure out their calls. Obviously, it's only something you can say afterwards because you don't want people to know that, but there were probably two or three teams where we sort of knew exactly what their line-out calls were, and obviously that made a huge difference in terms of being able to control the game, which is why we were so happy to give them as many line-outs as possible, because the more line-outs they lost, the, the, the more energy their pack of forwards would lose as well. Montgomery just uh, caught flat-footed there a little bit, had to turn quickly. Gets it away. He's not the greatest touch kicker, but his positional play is very good. And of course, his uh, place kicking in this tournament has been absolutely sensational. Yeah, just a stumble there by Montgomery. I'm just thinking, watching this game now, and the one thing we spoke about was um, Johnny's ability to kick and, and be tactically strong. But they had Johnny, but we had Free, Butchie, and Monty who all three of them, from a tactical kicking point of view, just control the whole tournament. We anticipated them kicking a lot of ball to us, and uh, we had always had two options. If they kicked badly, we knew Brian and JP were going to hurt them, and um, if they kicked well and it became a kicking contest, we knew that we had enough between our 9, 10 and 15 to win that, that deal. Great take, and it was a very good kick because he had to make a judgment. Was he outside the uh, 22 or inside it? Way, way upfield. Good positional uh, kick there. It's the line out taken quickly. So, here, yeah, when they, in the first five minutes, took their first quick throw in, that was a huge energy giver for us because it was almost like a stamp of approval in terms of our tactics that they didn't want to have lineups against us. That was the first sort of sign where our plan started getting some verification. I remember when this kick bounced just inside, uh, on the way there we had a long trot and I'd, I, I just sort of ran past the guy saying, yeah, that's exactly what we want boys. Things are starting to, to, to come, in, come together. Obviously, you five minutes in, so a half, half of that's bulldust. But I was just very, you know, making sure that they all got an understanding of what we were trying to achieve and that it was working. Shaw goes up. That was better by England. Now, this is a favourite ploy of the English. They're going to try and wear down these South African forwards. 
the first mall was also always something we speak about. You know, we'd lost the first physical duel of, of the scrum and we were going to make sure we weren't going to lose the second duel, which was obviously the drive. Good drive by South Africa in defence though. Matthew Tate with a bit of space and uh, immediately just loses his footing. A penalty to South Africa, Matthew Tate. Hanging on to the ball, that is not a good start for the youngster. And a real chance now for South Africa to put points on the board. Ten, please. Is she having a shot? Shot a goal. Just a bit more, Phil. Holding. No, no, he wasn't interfering. I know a player came over, but he wasn't interfering in play. Can you make sure I will. I will get that out of the way, yeah. John, make a conscious effort for your fellas at the breakdown, stay on the field, okay? You, with Alan, you just got to make sure that you're listening to him. If you just nodded your head and didn't do anything, he would get, take offence. So, you know, I'd, and I'd always only ever wait for moments where I was in front of Alan, where he, he could see that I was actually discussing the issue. But that three-point buffer obviously put a lot more calm into our, into our team as well. You know? We're inside South Africa's 22 at the moment. Again, Paul Saki was very quick out the starting blocks there. And Montgomery gets that one uh, halfway between the 22 and the 10 metre line. And certainly Montgomery is going to play a major role in this game for South Africa, that's for sure. Well, he's hugely experienced, but for me, he's played his best rugby of his career this World Cup. He's been very, very good. His kicking, his place kicking has been exemplary. Very confident under the high ball as well. Tested to the full in the semi-final by Argentina. So right now we're pretty chuffed with ourselves. They haven't had one completed line-out. Um, we've stopped their first drive and we've uh, been able to establish a three-point lead. People always say, sure, and it wasn't the most exciting final. And, um, and we are probably largely to blame for that because we weren't going to do anything untoward in our half. Uh, we were going to make sure that there was no chance for them to uh, to get anything by chance in, in our half. So um, everything that came was going to get kicked. I'll talk to him. Play. The thing about with me and referees was I always like to have a very fair or balanced exchange of instructions. So as a as a as a captain, you want to. <laughs> Make sure that if he's giving you a dressing down about your, your falling off on the wrong side and being off sides and staying on his feet, you take it on board and you respectfully attend to the situation, but you quickly, my intention was to find something that I could get him to focus on them and Katy provided me with that opportunity. South Africa have got uh, four players in their team tonight who scored four or more tries in the World Cup so far. Rousseau picks up at the base. For a Dupree, oh, almost uh, went over the top, but Gamasol was round on him like a flash, and that was a good tackle by Nick Easter. <laughs> Gamasol did really well. He held on to uh, Danny Rousseau at the base of that scrum and tried to, tried to charge down. Dupree was very nearly away there, but Nick Easter alert to the threat, did well to get round. Ben Kay supporting him. I'm not sure South Africa have had a throw at the line out yet. This is another one for Mark Reagan. And each time South Africa are challenging. It's very untidy at the line out as far as England are concerned at the moment. Gamerson pops on over the top, and that was, of course, the sort of kick that led to Josh Lucy's try in the semi final. Picked up by Simon Shaw. My cat was in attendance. And uh, Scott Berger there, trying to make life difficult for England. That's a good whip pass to Matthew Tate. This is better from Tate to Robinson. Paul Saki comes inside. 
And Paul Saki absolutely dumped on the floor there by Brian Havana. We had a back line that was incredibly quick and probably one of our best 13s ever in Jacques Free. And his ability to know when to drift and when to use his pace to his advantage was probably what made them such a good defensive unit. He was always the guy who controlled the nature of how our back line either pressed or drifted. Decision. Come and shot. Come and shot, please. Well, Wilkinson yes, loves these occasions. You sort of know that anything that's in the thin range, he's got a pretty much a 90% chance of getting that ball. This moment in itself was good because Brian, who later was chosen as the player of the tournament, you know, Brian was a big factor in this World Cup. He, had, you know, he scored a huge amount of tries and you know, he, you know, he putting in that tackle put, just gave him a buzz. You know? So we were happy to uh, concede those three points because it just put, put Brian on a, on a, on a different level. You know? He had a physical encounter with his opposition and he, and he really dominated that situation. So um, you give a penalty away in the corner like that, I mean, you know, you've got to tip your hat. Three points from there, that's Johnny Wilkinson at his best. Wilkinson, perfect. That was a brilliant kick by Johnny Wilkinson. Well, if you wanted one banker in your team, it would be him, wouldn't it? In a big game like this, he comes up with the goods. England three, South Africa three. Just over 12 minutes gone of this World Cup final. Our first restart. So I'm going to give you three guesses. Where do you think this is going to go? It's going to go <laughs> as deep as humanly possible. It did help having pretty much the rugby's fastest human being on the left wing. Taken by Saki, but hit hard by Habana for the second time in a couple of minutes. You know how many times we got that right in terms of being able to get man on ball? To, uh, to kick deep is one thing, but you're always giving your opposition time on ball. But to kick deep and still have your winger catch man on ball, that was really something quite special. And as you can see, the, the dividends thereof are enormous. So we see that tackle again. My well, goodness, he, was... he timed it perfectly. He waited for Saki to catch the ball. Saki didn't jump for it, and Havana just cleaned him up. I'm trying to remember what we called here. Ah, uh, yes. The fact that we got such a quick return meant that we were going to go with an attacking line-out. They didn't attempt to play at all, so we had a full go at attacking off the back of the line. Obviously, the turnover didn't help, but the successful kickoff meant that we needed to show an attacking mindset from the line-out. Gamasol puts it way downfield, but only into the arms of Percy Montgomery. Not good judgment by the England scrum half. Gamasol wants more. Eventually to Robinson, tries to run it. Good control by Robinson and the rest of the uh, England forwards there. Gamasol back to Wilkinson. Punted downfield. Not far enough, though. Once again, Butch James. I saw that. Skipper, there was a trip. There was a trip. Excuse me. There was a trip. I didn't see it. There was a trip. That's naughty, yeah. But I think it's those things that sort of all help. Puts us back in front in three points. Monty just, I mean, Monty was at his absolute peak. You know, he had the two-step going in, f in full splendor. So he wasn't, he hadn't missed much and he wasn't going to miss much on this day. But Monty had had an amazing, uh, uh, had a, an amazing tournament. Also one of the older guys, one of the guys that Jake had brought back. So, um, Having Monty there as a captain is probably one of the one of the greatest pleasures because you didn't really have to think, shall we go for the corner or shall we go for the poles? Because again, like with Johnny, Monty, there was always a pretty much a 90% chance that he was going to get the three-pointer. So Monty just kept the, the, the board ticking for us in every single test match that we played. It's a, a great asset to have as a captain to know that even if it's in the corner, if it's within range, you know, Monty's going to get it through. Wilkinson to restart for England. A little bit deeper this time into the arms of Skulk Berger, who takes it solidly and now runs at England. The human bulldozer. One thing you knew all the time with 
Skulk Burger is that he only had one way of playing and he was going to be a very uncomfortable old man one day. Not the most uh, perfect kick from Butch James, not the best one he's ever done, but as you said, Gamasol was herring through there. There's Brian Ashton. And uh, as you were saying, David, the territory there showing the advantage to England goes way, way over to Lewis Moody. Needs support, gets it through Shaw. Short tackle by Scott Berger. Gamasol gets a quick turnover. The England captain goes charging in. Just about 15 metres out, Wilkinson with a drop goal. <laughs> So, we more than 15 minutes into the game. We've only had one attacking opportunity of which we turned it over. We've been in our half probably for 12 of those minutes. And I honestly think that, that if that drop kick had gone over, it would have had a significant influence over the rest of this game. Because that would have been their tactic all along, just to get within range of Johnny. And, uh, and, uh, and I, don't, I don't think that they we're, we're going to try and outscore us, but they certainly would have used that as a tactic. So, probably the most significant miss uh, for us because it would have dented our confidence and it certainly would have affected theirs for the positive. And Johnny has, has the ability to be able to snap it from everywhere. I mean, he's won a World Cup like that already with the wrong foot, let alone the, you know, his left foot. So, it's, um, it was something that, that we, we spoke about a hell of a lot. So we'd often put Fury and Brian to get after him, but uh, it's, you know, he had a clear shot there and he didn't miss by far. Almost a great pass to the man of the match, Fury Dupree, the last time these two teams met here. Well, of course, it was an absolute pasting that England took. Simon Shaw picked up by Nick Easter. Just backs into Daniel not Rousseau, held, his opposite again. number. He's not held. Nick Easter once more. Is Nick Easter, of course, and Andrew Squeeze. Sheridan uh, from the same school of rugby. Stay there, Dulwich Ford. College in South London, playing in a World Cup final. JP Peterson there. Good take, and even Percy Montgomery's getting stuck in. Controlled by the South Africans just outside of their 22. And to scrum down, South Africa will get the put in this time. Well, that was a cracking kick by Wilkinson because where it came down, you, Peterson was just two metres outside the 22. And I think what we've got is we've got a scoreboard that's favourable, but you know, we, uh, when we spoke about absorbing the 20 minutes, I mean, you know, that's exactly what's happened. They've come at us and they've, they've, had, they've had most of the ball, they've had most of the territory. So I'm now thinking, okay, cool, we've absorbed. We've absorbed, but we actually haven't really had a, a go at anything yet. You know? So I'm now, in, in my sort of state of mind, I'm thinking, okay, the bravado is going to wear out at some stage and the rugby's then got to take over and the plan's got to take over. We need to start asserting our, our dominance, but we hadn't been so. I mean, to be fair, it was all England. Even though the scoreboard favoured us, um, and it was something we expected from the first 20, you know, it's still, you, you, you'd you like a little bit of insurance, a little bit of a buffer, but we got none of that. Um, we had to be a lot more patient than we thought we would uh, need to be on this, on this particular occasion. Wait there, 13, wait! Well, that was wonderfully taken by Mike Cat. What can Cat do here? The speed in the legs is perhaps not what it used to be. Oh. Great take by Montgomery. England have kept our wings very busy with the up and unders. You know, we expected them to make a massive aerial onslaught onto our, onto our back three, but not quite as much as they ended up doing. Mark Cueto has got some pace when he's got space, and look at this fellow go. Oh. Uh, a disappointing move there. Which, well, uh, I, don't, I don't know why Matthew Tate came on the inside. You know, he, he, it was a two on one. It should just have been, he was coming on the inside. Corey thought he was on, still on the outside. And there was, you know, it, he's a quick guy, Tate. He should have backed himself to take, on, take him on the outside. It just shows a little bit of naivety from time to time, does Matthew Tate. He's obviously uh, a player of great promise. Matfield. Oh. Absolutely soared above everybody else there. 
And Joanne Smith takes it away. So that a, three a wonderful one, flank forward, no, the big advantage. South African number seven. Advantage being played, and South Africa get a penalty. Well, again, poor discipline by England. They didn't need to concede the penalty there. They just dived over, over the top. The top That's a little bit too huh? much adrenaline still. Yeah, it's all right. Doesn't matter. You took him over the top. Had a shot. Shot called. <laughs> oh, Bucky's. <laughs> <laughs> Get me busy, but what a treat! Um, we were fortunate in the kind of personnel we had and the, and the characters we had. Obviously, Monty with his short lineup didn't have this kind of distance. But this kid, as a 19-year-old, came into the squad, and uh, I think this sort of youth and exuberance sort of made him oblivious to being nervous of big occasions, and he just had this. Absolute monster boot. So I said to him, you know, whatever you do, just make it go over the distance because it puts them back kicking the ball to us. So rather than getting a line out, I said, let's have a crack at three points with this rocket launcher. And uh, worst case scenario, make sure that it goes over the try line so that we can have a crack at getting the ball back. The other thing about letting Francie kick from that far out was also a way to indicate to the opposition that you're going to take less chances from further out because there's a potential of a three-pointer if you are going to stand on the wrong side or get your hands into a ruck closer to halfway. Little kick over the top there by the outside half. Oh, my goodness, but James almost Seven retrieved it. Out. Well, he did retrieve it, but uh, just lost his footing. And a very good attacking position here for South Africa. Good tackling coming in from the England defence. Good turnover, though. And uh, Jacques Ferry just tidying things up. But eventually it has to be cleared up by Joanne Smith. A little bit untidy from South Africa. Good defence by England. Anyway, uh, South Africa are going at the moment is backwards. There's a big tackle coming in by Johnny Wilkinson. And that was very well played indeed. This is the hardest job. Sitting there with your entire future in 15 other people's hands. <laughs> Having worked for four years, hoping that they've listened to something you've said and that it sinks in. And if they listen, you get to keep your job and win. And if they don't, you lose and get fired the next week. Wonderful job. Yeah, we were pretty fortunate, you know, to stroke a genius with um, Jake bringing it in and at a late stage as a replacement for Rassi and, and Alistair, just such a good rapport with our backs and yeah, Gert was is a genius. You know, him and Victor as a combination of, of figuring out first phase was amazing. But Eddie was a, was a great outsider to have because he came in there with no preconceived ideas as a South African, and he would give us an honest opinion of how we were doing things and how we were going about things. And the guys all respected him. He had a huge, you know, obviously a very impressive coach, an impressive resume, and a, and, a, and we had a team that was well established and and liked the fact that there was a coach there that would challenge us. I'm still just looking to see where Wilkinson is, or Cat. It's Cat who's standing in the outside half position. Well, England had quite an interesting alignment. Mike Cat was standing at 10. Johnny Wilkinson was standing fractionally behind him, and a couple of yards behind him was Mark Coeto there. There was the take by Simon Shaw, one-handed. So... With these moments like this, it's always time for the sort of brain stress to get together. So my go-to guys would always be Fari and Victor. So Fari would have an idea of how things were going and how much pressure he was feeling and whether or not we had to up the ante as a pack of forwards. And Victor would give us an idea from a line-out point of view in terms of what was working. So we always always either reconfirm what we were doing and how we were doing it or use these moments with little stoppages medically to change our tactic and adapt to what was in front of us. And uh, our, our chat there was really about um, continuing. We, had, we, we were absorbing well, um, the sort of excitement from the English was starting to fade, and uh, we hadn't played yet, but we were going to be patient. Oh, Gamasol there was under pressure from Fury Dupree. It had to be cleaned up by Nick Easter, but even he was pushed backwards over the halfway line. So Wilkinson, and England persisting with these up and under. Scott Berger goes up but misses that one. 
And uh, Furry Dupree once more to Wilkinson. Spins it away to Robinson. That's a good kick by Robinson, but uh, that again only goes as far as Furry Dupree. And when you see Jason Robinson kicking a ball, you know that their tactics are, are, are pretty similar to ours. Yeah, it's amazing when I look back and I'm watching this game for the first time. And again, every time I see some kind of physical imposing, it's one of either two people, four green or seven green. Juan Smith, one of the unsung heroes of this team. He was just a guy that got through a huge amount of work and always got the job done without any fanciness about him. But he was just colossal in his physicality and his ability to impose himself on an opposition. Just uh, going out towards the touchline. No real penetration. Mike Cat looking for support. This is better from England now. Oh, that was a great tackle. Otherwise, Robinson had support there. No. Okay, okay. Still halfway between South Africa's 22 and the 10 metre line, but they've turned it over. Montgomery. Paul Saki is there to cover this one. Oh, bounces over his head and into touch. Well, that was a shame because I thought it was a poor kick by Montgomery. If I'm not mistaken, they've only completed one line out um, so far within the 26 minutes. So we were going to we were going to continue to kick as many balls out as possible because with every line out that they lost or didn't complete, it sort of would take more and more energy away from their pack of forwards. And all we needed to do was trust in JP, Brian, and Monty to feel the high balls that they were giving us. England go driving on. This is what we didn't want. And this is exactly what the England pack would have, would have wanted to get from the outset. So it's sort of, you can get away with it because they're still deep in their, in their half. You broke away with the ball carrier, must be able to be tackled. When you broke away, you had men in front of the player. Scrum it down, accidental offside. Oh, yes! He's saying he broke away there. He's still binding on to it. Well, I think that's a harsh decision because he was bound on right the way up until uh, he broke away there. We were up against a pretty formidable scrummaging unit. And so, you know, I, I, we didn't want to get too involved in a, a scrummaging war. So the old ball in, ball out was what we wanted. And um, CJ was, uh, well, you yeah, know, he wasn't the tightest who was starting in the beginning of the tournament. BJ Boiler was our starting title at the time, and uh, he got injured. So CJ had a, a big job. He was up against uh, a formidable loose head in Andrew Sheridan. Um, and so you, know, you can see my, my tactic was to sort of let us take care of Phil, who are, you know, who also is a machine. And um, most of my attention was always to hit towards CJ and give CJ as, as much as much support as possible against Sheridan, who was an absolute monster. You said. Here's a mark, Crouch. Thank you, Crouch. For us, a successful scrum was getting that ball out and being able to carry on playing. What a two packs, should I say, of absolutely huge men. Good little run there by Francois Stein onto Jacques Ferry. Jacques Ferry was well tackled, and there goes Francois Stein again. Takes it on a couple of metres, stolen by England. So again, first, second time we've tried to play some rugby and a second turnover. So now we're back in our half, back to absorbing all over again. Well, that was great play by England. Mike Catt was screaming for it in the midfield as soon as he saw the turnover. And he knew that all the South African defenders were up. There was no one home out back. Great piece of ripping there by Matthew Tate, I think it was. But look at that long pass to, to Cat. He had plenty of options to kick uh, to pass to Gummersell, but he picked out Mike Cat, and Mike Cat threaded it into the corner. Yeah, by this stage, I've thrown a million balls to Victor. You know, we were probably at the stage where we didn't even need to make a call. I could just see in his eyes where he was going. Um, but yeah, there was always going to be a pretty short ball uh, and straight straight to being kicked out. Forward, 
Heritage Green, knock on. The rocket launcher. 19 year old rocket launcher kicks at 75 meters. He had an incredibly good super rugby campaign with the Sharks. Um, and he was this hot kid out of the school circuit, but he was also a big boy. So, you know, he was right up Jake's alley. And, and Jake put a huge amount of confidence and faith in him because he was the perfect kind of player for Jake. And Francie responded to that as well. You know, Francie grew in stature when people put their faith in him. And that's exactly what Jake did with Francie. Francie was never going to fail for Jake. And again, I mean, what were you scared of when you were 19 years old? You know, what's a World Cup final? You know, he's probably at that stage, you probably knew he had another three World Cups in him. And there's the flank forward, Joanne Smith, though, but pushed backwards a couple of meters. Keeping it close. Still not over the halfway line. Still only three points between these two sides. One or two people have, uh, well, a huge number of people, I guess, have been contemplating what might happen in this game. One or two have said it may well go to extra time. Who knows? That was well taken, though, and uh, driven on by Mark Queto. The right wing, uh, left winger, rather, for England. Back to Wilkinson. Just uh, drills it low, not particularly far. I'll never forget. I look at the um, the princes there. I've got this photo of the two of them afterwards, and I, and I and I and I felt so bad. But we just come out, and, and these guys looked like they'd been run over by a bus. And I, I said, you know, do you mind if I have a photo? And they reluctantly said yes. But it's this glorious photo of the two of them looking devastated, and me with this cheesy smile. Beautiful. Back, back to Joanne Smith at the back of the line. And uh, already over the gain line, quick ball, Montgomery, well tackled by Martin Corey. It's the first time we've played rugby in 31 minutes. It's the first time we've been able to finish up a singular move and it's turned over again. It spins out on the England side, picked up by Nick Easter, now on to Robinson. Robinson had Cueto and Martin Corey outside him but decided to dart back inside. One of the things we were discussing was at every stop, as you're saying, and I was saying to Faree, I said, like, we, we honestly do need, we do need to get some territory because without territory, I mean, we weren't going to play out of our own half. I mean, if we weren't in their half, we weren't, we weren't going to end up playing at all. So I think what we could feel is that in the second quarter, we were starting to spend a little bit more time in their half. I mean, we've had already had a few more plays where we've actually put something together. Even though the turnovers were coming, at least we were playing a little bit more rugby, whereas in the first quarter we got nothing done. We were just basically absorbing and defending. The other thing that sort of kept me reasonably calm was that the uh, beating of chests and the sort of handbags and the, the, the you know, the sort of work, the sort of being worked up um, had started to sort of fade somewhat uh, from the England side. So the absorption has started to work, but you know, we also needed to start playing and putting something in place. Stay away! But South Africa still have it. John Smith, the captain, goes charging forward. Stay away! Supported by Daniel Rousseau. Looking for Brian Habana, who almost took it one handed and stolen by England. So South Africa have it. JP Peterson now chips one over the top, only into the arms of Mark Cueto. Bad decision should have gone wide that time. So Gamasol spins it off his left hand once again to Wilkinson, who has to go right footed. He's under pressure there from Brian Habana. Well taken by Butch James and back inside to Montgomery. Very high kick from the South African fullback. Martin Corey is there, runs at the opposition. Good play from the flank forward. Ben Kay almost mishandled. So probably the most heartening thing was, even though there were still some turnovers, but we actually saw a little bit more rugby in the, in the second quarter of the game. Uh, in terms of us being able to at least get our hands on the ball, carry a little bit of ball and try and develop some kind of confidence from a from an attacking point of view. 
Well, this is a great tackle by Matt Tate. I think Francois Stein should have looked to offload a little bit earlier there. He was looking to take on the youngster. Our president, incredible to see him flying in to come and say good luck to the team. The guys didn't believe me when I called them in the morning. I said, guys, I needed you in the team room. The president said to say good luck. This was when we started to feel we were getting the ability to start imposing ourselves from an attack point of view. But James looking for support. J.P. Peterson is there. I think this is the first time we've gotten into the 22 as well. They spin it across now. They've got a real chance. Ostu Rant, whose international career spans well over 10 years. Scott Berger is there. They've got a real chance here. Less than five minutes to go in this first half. They've still got a chance. They've got a man over. And they've just brought down in front of the line. John Smith, the captain it was, who almost scored there. Oh, I wanted to reach out. <laughs> I wanted to reach out. I thought, jeez, if I reach out and we lose this, it'll be the, 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 the next turnover that stops us from attacking. So we played all of our all of our runners played off off nine or three because he was the guy that would decide when we went to ten or not. And so, you know, obviously myself and uh, Jean and, and and Donny, they're sort of primary ball carriers, but we hadn't really had much to do. But this was the first time we'd actually ran and, and bumped a few guys and gotten going. So, um, and we hadn't been here for so long. You know, we hadn't been on the attack and put them under pressure and watching watching them. You know sort of feel feel the, the brunt of, of, of us running, which was our, you know, that was sort of our, our blueprint, was getting the big boys to run hard at an angle of nine and creating good enough ball for Butchie and the rest of his crew to make a plan. And so just uh, as the clock is stopped here, we can take a look at this again. Desperate defence by England. Line breaks like this from guys like Francie are what really will make the difference in a game like this. I mean, that, that singular break gave us an opportunity to be in there 22 for the first time in nearly 40 minutes. Mark Regan was, um, he was an interesting guy to play against. He, he, he was never short of a few words. Um, and, you know, Mark was also, also one of those guys who, you know, he was always trying to get a reaction, trying to sort of put some bait out there for the likes of Skulk and Buckies and, and those chaps. Um, but by this stage of the game, we sort of had moved past that sort of the rah-rah part of it. And, uh, and this is an important this is an important part of the game for us because we know we're in a pretty solid, even though it's not our ball, we've got four minutes to get some kind of points on the board. And um, I, mean, I, I mean, everyone knows any kind of points before half time just puts your, your, change, your half time change room talk into a different level. But the significant thing about the stoppage is that's where Monty did his MCL. So Monty basically played the rest of this final with his, his MCL completely off. Uh, and so the, for the rest of the kicks, everything, that was him. He, I think after this game, he, it took him another three or four months to play for, for Pepino, which was his new club. Here's a mark. Crouch! Touch! Oh, so we were desperate yeah, to disrupt the scrum, get some kind of result out of the next few minutes. And this is the worst possible scrum to have. Yeah, so what we did is obviously, you know, their biggest threat would have been Sheridan. So we, um, we'd we shift around, I'd frustrate Mark, I'd get off the mark, trying to get outside of Sheridan. And um, yeah, you, you know, our intention was to turn this into a bit of a lottery. We didn't want the scrum to be, you know, contestable. We wanted to put Alan in a situation where he's got to make a decision. And whatever ball they did get, if they got it, it needed to be ugly. Because if it's ugly, it affects the kick and gives us a line out. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, we took a gamble obviously because of the position in the field uh, and it paid off. We completely ran around full victory and managed to swindle the referee for a turnaround scrum. Uh, interesting, John Smith Touch. was right up in the middle of that front row there. Touch. So a big scrummage Touch. now for Fur Dupree and his eight forwards. He's going to be harried and hustled by Gamasol, picked up by Rousseau. Rousseau almost to the line, my goodness. Yes, you forget how close our two attempts with myself and Donnie were at that line. They're absolutely inches short of the England line. 38 and a half minutes gone. Still no try in this game. Can South Africa get five points on the board? Just watching to the far side there. One of the big men driving on. Good tackling by England. Manning Corey trying to get his foot to the ball. Great English defence here. South Africa still driving on. A penalty to South Africa. That hopefully was the result we were looking for. Job done. It's, it's, it's all we spoke about. So, you know, when Monty was down, when obviously that's when I got together with the Tide you know, I said to the Tide 5, okay, we're going to go left, and then we're going to go right, we're going to pop, we're going to shift off the mark. The scrum is going to be messy. We're going to take a little bit of a gamble, and all we need is the ball back. Either we turn over the scrum, or we get them to kick out short. And so, the reason why it was significant is because it, it actually turned out the way we wanted it to. We got the penalty, and it's just before halftime as well. So I then I then get to go into halftime saying, guys, we've stuck it out. It's been a you know, tough 40. We've absorbed the hell of a lot. But we stuck to our guns, and the things that we've stuck to have worked. So a lot of it, obviously, is a little bit of propaganda, but it couldn't have worked out any better for us going into halftime because... You know, we had specifically gone out to disrupt this scrum, get get us some kind of position and turn it into either five points or three points. And without an MCL, Monty delivered the three points to us just before half time. So, yeah, as a captain, I couldn't have asked for a better way to finish the first half of the final. And uh, I could feed off the positive energy of our small little plan right at the end of half time. So, a th 45 second period altered the kind of approach I took to the to the halftime talk and I'll never forget as you saw earlier Jake was putting his jacket on because he always met me early and we would have a quick little 30 second bash around what the message was going to be and uh, and it, it was amazing at first he was like stick to what we were going to talk about you know this is this this last 30 seconds was exactly what we need to keep on doing and so we're going to stick to that and and he and I were just out of the same hymn sheet you know we spoke about absorbing we spoke about the fact that that you know yeah, they, were, they, they couldn't uh, they couldn't maintain that for another 40 minutes and also that we needed to focus a little bit more on territory and uh, and execute the kicking game more they were kicking far more on us and so we were the ones sort of losing the kicking battle at that stage but we finished the half the way we wanted to play in general and we got the three points and so we focused on that so the half time was a very calm very positive affair rather than geez guys 40 minutes it's just been England the whole time. They've kicked us. They've kept us in our half, and we've what we've had. We've we've spilt. Um, so you can just imagine the sort of psychological effect on what that team talk could have could have had. So we actually came out feeling very positive about the situation, and and we should have been. It was uh, nine points to three, but it didn't. I guess it wouldn't have felt like that for an English player. What's up? Let's have a look. <sighs> It's funny, my predictions of who was going to be first wasn't spot on, but reasonably close. All the clowns have come out first. So out of the blocks is clown number one. Watch James. Don't want to give anything away, Smitty, but we win in the end. Idiot. John de Villiers, clown two. Smitty, surely you're not sitting down for the first time since 2007. He's also hungover from last night, which explains his remarks. Um, and then Habana goes, now we're just waiting for the third clown, Jacques Free's comment, to complete the Joker trifecta. And with Scullerberger laughing, my next comment was, idiots. We haven't had a response to that yet, so let's see how we go for the next half. <laughs> so 
South Africa coming out. Mate, I can't remember, but I don't think we made any changes. I think I was the first change when I went off for blood. And that was with, uh, what, a couple of minutes to go. Yeah, I, Jake wasn't going to change here. Right. It was probably the most sort of, it was electric in terms of walking out because the noise was incredible. And the, the beautiful thing about playing the English is that they just, they got this amazing ability to sing and make a, a huge amount of noise. And whether it's against you or for you, it's it just, you feed off it, you know, and it just made the stadium feel unbelievably powerful. Um, I mean, at this stage, you're so, so, so in the zone. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't really bother you. You're in France, so whether that noise is for the team you're playing against or for you, it's irrelevant. It just creates this sort of ambiance that you've you know, worked and played for your whole life to be in front of. Well, it looks like Matt Stevens is on. Martin Corey leading the, uh, the side on. Yeah, Fuller struggled. He, I think he took a knock early. And he's such a brave guy. He's really a, an absolute warrior, and he, he soldiered on. Um, and, we, and we could feel it in the scrums because, you know, he was, uh, he was up against us and you know, he just wasn't himself. And he was, such a, he, was, he was normally such a great competitor, but uh, he'd taken a knock earlier and he'd sort of soldiered on for the first half. We have a minute to go. We have a minute to go, OK? We have a minute. So I'm going to give you one guess where you think this ball's going to go. What she's thinking. Is it going deep or deep or deep? Yeah, thumbs up for deep, Butchie. <laughs> this will decide the destination of this sixth World Cup. Okay. The Sassanator. Are you up there? Okay. Matthew Stevens has come on, on for the captain, Phil Vickery, who is in the wars during this uh, first half. But South Africa get the second half underway. You are the lucky winner of a deep kickoff. Not Butchie's finest uh, effort. It puts Brian in the mix for some pressure. Wilkinson taking up the position of centre. Not a particularly good kick. JP Peterson. Is caught there by Matthew Tate, England centre. Dupree. It's uh, gone a bit high. And uh, not terribly deep as far as England were concerned. Ben Kay takes it on, loops it around. Big pass there to Martin Corey. Uh, the is, the, you can just see the nerves. Is that a streaker? OK, let's go. There's a off. spectator on the pitch being chased away by one of the marshals. No, I don't even remember that. Well, what an idiot. I mean, really, the World Cup final and you try and do something stupid like that. I hope he spends a couple of nights in the cells in Paris with no, nothing but food and water. This is the first I've ever come across the... I, I promise you, if you'd asked me to put my house in the fact that there was a Jimmy Jumper running onto the pitch in the final, I honestly would have bet against it. Wow. You learn something every day. Could have at least put a shoulder in. So the first set piece of this uh, second half taken at the front of the line out by... Simon Shaw, Mark Reagan, quick to go around on that line out. This is good aggressive play, but great defence as well by South Africa. Oh, and here comes the moment. England's World Cup dreams shattered in half a centimetre. Matthew Tate gets away. This great young centre from Newcastle is going. Matthew Tate brought down a couple of metres short. Superb play by Matthew Tate. Gubbersal out wide. Try in the corner. Queto for England, my goodness. To be fair, I'm glad I wasn't the, 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 the TV ref. Stuart, can you just confirm, is there any reason I cannot give a try, please? Yeah. <laughs> um, I anticipated that there was a chance there was going to be a try. So the first thing to do is just to bring everyone together. Um, you know, it's always difficult because you've got to try and stop the guys from looking at the TV or trying to see what the, the call is. Um, but you've got, to, you've got to come up with a plan after this, you know. This would have put them either a point behind or a point ahead. So how, how this ended up would have changed our tactics. So we, had, we would then discuss a plan for how we would approach the next 20 minutes, depending on whether we are a point behind or, or, or point ahead. And if, if, we were, if it was not a try, 
then we would basically carry on regardless. Because it's the first time that they've broken our line in 42 minutes. So it was really just a waiting game to see. And Stu Dickinson played out of his boots. Aussie of the year, 2007. Yeah, let's have a look, take your time. I get asked this question every single time I do a Q&A or a speech or talk in, in, the, in, in the UK. We're in London and, um, oh, so close. And every single time, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I sort of facetiously have to mention that, let's say they got the try and the sort of conversion, it still doesn't make up 15 points. And that doesn't go well. It's normally the end of the Q&A from, from there. But I am glad I'm not one person, and that's Stuart Dickinson, because it's a big call to make. I think Alan Roland was just delighted that it wasn't up to him. But yeah, uh, one John. thing it did uh, alert us to is that it, it, it was the one thing we didn't want them to do is break our line. We were quite happy to defend, but we, we just certainly didn't expect line breaks. The two princes praying that five points will go on the board for England in defence of their title. And Mr. Dickinson upstairs, the TV match official. Well, he can watch this all he likes, but the, the important thing is he has to make a decision. So this took a hell of a long time. So right now we're waiting, but while this was happening and while it started off, we were busy discussing what our options would be. So I uh, then obviously got the guys together we discussed the line break, so first of all, the intention was to be able to keep them out. Ball was in touch, ball was in touch, ball was in touch, okay, no try. No oh. try, oh my goodness. And then when that happened, that was such an energy giver because it took so long, so we knew that it was close. So this was almost like us scoring a three-pointer um, in terms of our energy levels, you know. And then that obviously was beautiful because then we started seeing some frustration and some disappointment and, and this was this is probably the best three-pointer we've ever <laughs> ever conceded so um it was a, this is a obviously a, a, a great a, a, you know, a great result for us in terms of how this ended up going from a possible five to seven pointer to a three-pointer and the added bonus is that it felt like it was almost energy towards us because Caddy came up and he started having a yarn and the frustration was showing as well so um we just I just turned it into a positive. I said, boys, that's the last line break they make. And, uh, and I said, we've got to chase eight points. Our, our talk was about getting that eight points ahead. So once the eight points buffer came, we could then really close the taps and make it impossible for them to play rugby. Oh, just scrapes off the post. But at least it is some points for England. And they get within three of South Africa after 43 minutes. Thanks, Joe. Good call. Great little step, yo. You guess it, deep. Huge amount of support in the Stade de France for England. Behind the ball. And a huge number of Englishmen at home and abroad will be thinking that should have been a try, but that is history now. The long sleeves is a, a long story, <laughs> but I tell you what, I am um, always sweated a huge amount and uh, we got given the option of having the choice and I don't know if you remember, but uh, Os started the tournament with one short and one long, so his binding arm was short so that there was nothing to hold on to and his right arm, which is the, the arm he connected to the hooker on, was long and we all had the ability to, to custom design the kind of shirt we wanted. So I went with the long sleeves because I was forever putting the strapping on my wrists to stop the sweat from going onto my hands. Um, and uh, it really just was to be able to control the moisture of my hands and be able to not have to worry about drying my hands for every line out. Um, our line out effectivity w was heavily reliant on me being there first all the time. So I couldn't dilly dally with drying the ball. Kick 
saved by the second uh, row forward. Great skills by the big fella. Great skills. And Peterson very wide, and he obviously knew he was wide. He's put it in behind Kuwait if it had been a little bit longer. So you can see, as one of the the tacticians of the game, he, I mean, he's certainly no kicker, but our intention was to start getting more time in their, in their 22, in their half. And, uh, and Victor, I mean, who really is, is just a, a rugby genius. Well, England need to do something about Jason Robertson quickly. Because South Africa had the, had the, you know, if they'd made it, if they cleared the ball from that line out, there's a physio attending to Robinson out here. There's a clear overlap. Mike Katz in trouble as well. We expect him to be quite a threat in attack, and um, there was a moment in the first half where he got some broken ball um, position. And, I mean, I was the guy that was in the middle of the field having to defend him, and I literally just guessed. I thought, I thought, okay, I'm going for left shoulder. And he did, thankfully, step onto my left shoulder. But it was sort of the first thing that we'd seen from Jason, and he was one of the, the guys that had done a huge amount of analysis on him. The only reason I chose to, to go left because I couldn't leave a guy like Jason to the last minute to make a decision. I just wasn't mobile enough to, to be able to adapt. But we figured out that his preference was more than 70% to step off the left. He was just an incredible stepper. So um, it was a reasonably calculated guess, but he was an incredibly good rugby player, but he certainly was in a final that he had a huge impact on. And uh, if Hipkiss is on, I suspect that Matthew Tate will go to fullback. Well, I think he has, yes, which is interesting. A great moment for Daniel Hipkiss. That's a more, more. No, Mr. Not Tigers outside. centre, obviously playing in his first World Cup final. That's a good drive by England there. Scrums are still taking a beating, but we're sort of hanging in there and surviving. And the introduction of Matt Stevens obviously made it a lot more challenging. I tell you what, these English forwards are really fired up now. He kept us and myself quite busy for that uh, second 40 minutes. So now really our ball became a lot faster, so we had to do a lot more with our ball and we had to certainly hang in a lot more on their ball as well. We still obviously wanted to give CJ a huge amount of support. He was still up against Sheridan, you know, um, and so we're in the sort of first 10 minutes of the first half where we're now starting to, you know, we're starting to realise that, you know, because Full was obviously hurting, we've now got this younger, you know, bigger prop coming on who's now fully fit. So he started giving, um, also run for his money as well. So uh, we really, we, we got, up, I mean, in these days, the scrums weren't penalised half as much as they are today. But we did, we got off, we got off quite lucky in terms of the this, this, this scrummage. It was the one area where we, we certainly did not have any ascendancy. Yeah. Other than us tactically messing them around for the, the, the end of the first half penalty, um, we, we did as much as we could to hang in. And uh, good shielding there by Nick Easter. As, uh, Wilkinson to touch, so the danger for the time being has been alleviated. Incredible player, Johnny Wilkinson. I mean, just the inclusion of him alone in this final, you know, made us have to approach this game in a, in, a, in a far different way. Just one of the game's greats in terms of how he managed the game and how he could influence a team. The stadium is absolutely humming here. And at the moment, it's not for South Africa, it's for England. Great take. Victor Madfield soaring above everybody. And young Stain staying on his feet, driving forward. Tremendous run by the no, South no, African no. centre. Hands out, six England! Hands! She's painted all day. Six. Thank you, Martin. South Africa have Do actually got a penalty. I call Rook, I call hands out, you're on the ground, you're out of the game. Please. Again, not too much thought process. I mean, this. It's the first time that we've come off an attacking line. It's the first time we haven't been turned over. And um, but we still haven't finished and executed a first phase move on attack from a line out. But 
the result's easy. I mean, it's not even a discussion. For as a captain, we were in such a, a you know good place that you know I wouldn't even have to call Monty. He'd be on his way already. This is you know it's a three pointer in our final. You take everything that's put on the plate for you, um, and that was going to be our plan from from, from the start. So. Um, as much as we didn't get to finish the play, this is the first play that gave us a bit of confidence on attack because it resulted in three points. Inch perfect. Finally, we had a great line-out off the top to France. He didn't finish the actual launch move, but got over the gain line by 20, 30 meters, came off a, a, a ball to, to, to myself, getting back into the defense. Penalty, at least turned into some points. So. Again, now now we're in that sort of six-point marker. So now all we're doing is sniffing territory uh, to try and get a, a stab at another three-pointer to get to that eight-point mark. South Africa 12, England 6. Ten minutes gone of this second half. Scott Berger heavily tackled. Fury Dupree whips it away, though, to Butch James. That's only going to go as far as Nick Easter. Nick Easter back inside to Matthew Tate. And we're playing it fullback, of course, because of the injury to Jason Robinson. Interesting to see Toby Flood on. He's a very, very gifted footballer. But will he handle the pressure of a World Cup final? Backline was run by Butchie. Fury made a lot of the calls. Um, initially, we went into the World Cup with Jean de Villiers uh, doing a lot of the leadership from an attack point of view and uh, running the D. So when Jean went down, um, Fury and Butchie took over attack uh, and uh, basically Butchie call, would call the moves. Fury would obviously make the, make the plays and um, D was then run by Butchie. I mean, Butchie was a master um, at defence. So uh, he, he literally, yeah, he, would, he took charge. But we had to make an adaption late, obviously, because of the the exit of Jean de Villiers. So, you know, Fury would obviously, from a set face point of view, he would uh, he would be the one who decided on our attacking move, and Butchie would be the communicator. So he would be the general, making the calls, giving it down there, and he was the guy leading the defence from a back line point of view. Get out! Now can South Africa, the likes of Joanne Smith and Matt Field here, dominate the line out in this second half? Scott Berger is midfield. This, our first move after 52 minutes, going wide, and look at the result. So, what do you think I said next? <laughs> I gave them a chance, they wanted to go wide, and it went out from first phase. So, I'm pretty sure that's the last time we attempted anything wide. this World Cup final. It's moments like that that I think sometimes people don't truly understand how much of an effect it has on both teams because the game's in a balance. There's only about 25 minutes left and every little inch, every little bit of position helps. And they, they were in a, an awkward exit position where they're just outside their 22. All they needed to do was get themselves over the halfway line and a little knock-on like that is just is a massive blow. Uh, it gives us energy that we didn't have to work for, and it takes away energy that they didn't need to lose. That's okay, ball is out. And Dupree just gets away from Simon Say Shaw. Say back. Joanne Smith in support. South Africa not standing Four particularly green, wide the ball. at the moment. Four. Just getting themselves reorganized, keeping it close. But a penalty to England. Number three, offense, running in front. Number three, running in front. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, everything about this game was physical. Sorry. Your mark. I think it's the one thing that you don't have to worry about in a final like this is that as a captain sometimes you wonder if the boys are up for it, but you know, if you're gonna get to a World Cup final in a team that's reasonably efficient and you're a captain that's gotta get guys G'd up for a World Cup final, yeah, I think you sort of you have missed the boat. 
So both teams would have had more than enough motivation to bring everything they've got and leave it untouched. Um, Manfield went up to challenge for that, but Simon Shaw was up to the task. Hip kiss goes for England. Gamasol, a little bit of indecision there. Wilkinson, a little sidestep, slips it to Nick Easter. Gamasol, though, tackled by John Smith, the South African captain. Well, they were desperately trying to work the narrow side there. They had overlap there. Hands out three. Watch the feet. Watch the feet. Well, if England can retain possession from here, they've got men on both sides. Interesting to see which way they go. In close down quickly was uh, hip kiss. You know, watching this game after 10 years, and, okay. and obviously we did a, a lot of defending, but I, you know, I'd forgotten just how good Jacques Fury was as a 13 defender, as an outside centre. His ability to choose when to press from the outside or when to drift, and his ability to fix an incorrect decision was incredible with the pace that he had. But I mean, I'm watching him now, and he, his ability to bounce back, his ability to close off and, and make Johnny's decision-making just that much more difficult was, was incredible. I'm not disputing he was on his feet. He was not. Yeah, I'm trying to politely indicate that he's made the wrong decision, um, but it's consistent with how he's been playing all all, all day. You know? I, I was trying to persuade him that we had somehow created ascendancy in, in the tackle area, but it's the ball carrier, and this was too much parity to expect a turnover. But just as gently so, another seed of doubt, keeping his ear. The trouble with a, a referee that's as strong as Roland is that. When they get into a captain's ear and they start pointing fingers and they get quite sort of domineering, if you keep quiet and allowed to continue, it sort of becomes more and more of an issue. So he sort of needed to, I just needed to get some volume in his ear. He was holding. No, he wasn't. England still have it. This is Paul Saki. Good tackle coming in by John Smith. Green, away. And by Victor Medfield. Hands out, Green. Just laid back there by Nick Easter, England number eight. Oh, oh my goodness, that was so, so close. Matthew Tate almost had it in his hands. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure whether I was on the edge of the seat because I thought it might have been an interception because I, th well, because I thought England might be under the post, but... All the attack was coming from no man's land, so they were out of range for Johnny's boot. And so we were playing in a, in a defensive way that was forcing them to play in the middle of the field, which is the hardest place to play if, if you don't have an incredible attack. So with a defence that was as tight as ours was, their frustration was, was growing because they were doing all the attack but not actually getting enough dividends out of it because they weren't getting close enough for Johnny to have a crack at a drop kick or, and they weren't getting enough penalty shots as well. So they're getting all the ball and they're making all the attack, but it's, you know, it's, it's J.P. Peterson shooting out and making their three and one a knock-on. It's uh, Jacques Fury closing the space and making Johnny change his direction. So, um, as exhausting as it was for us, it certainly, it, it certainly was something that was, up until this point, working quite effectively. So we were having to defend more, but we were making sure that we were allowing them to only attack in, a, in that sort of awkward area. Scrum half puts one over the top. And uh, Cueto just wonder, took a quick one. You wonder, just little signs of cracks beginning to appear in the South African game. It's not often that Fury's um, made an error like that, but uh, they've now started, you know, we started the half with a bit of time in their, in their half, a nice attacking play, that sort of penalty that we got, now we've, the pendulum swung again, so now we're busy absorbing again. Well, here we go, England on the attack once more. Hipkiss trying to get through, but again, tackled by no! Butch James no! and by Jacques Ferry. But great support coming for England. Up towards South Africa's 22. React, react, react. Get on with it. Gamasol saying to his forwards, come on, go. Get stuck in. Matthew Stevens there, number 17, in support. Coming on the tight side again. 
Well, Matthew Tate has gone very, very wide. Out on the left-hand side. More, more. Well, certainly, that tactic would be clear. Oh, Wilkinson oh, would put in a right-footed kick over to the far side. Matthew Tate's just come in a little bit, but uh, real problems there for Montgomery, who goes scurrying over the advertising boards there. And the referee, or the touch judge, rather, just has a little word with Toby Flood. And as well, well Alex James. I'm trying to figure out because I'm sure I got into his ear about this. Oh, yeah, we go. <laughs> Look, I'm not penalising him. End of story. I'm mm. not penalising him. Yeah. Quite bizarre, really. Well, it was nasty. It's a push. And I don't even think it was a penalty, to be fair. I think we ended up kicking off the 22. So, I. Uh, I think you know, that was when I sort of trying to put pressure on Alan Rulon. <laughs> well, the captain just Time having a word. And, uh, it's a mistake, so I try and remind him of that. Butch James goes across, right-footed, pushes it. Way, way downfield, taken by Flood. He's got a big boot on him himself. I was watching him warming up and he was launching some massive kicks. Monty fully recovered after introducing himself to the cameraman. Hands out! It was uh, England coming up on the ball very, very quickly indeed. Good wait, clearance. Five, wait. Way downfield. And uh, Matthew Tate, who's played uh, three different positions for England. Fullback, wing, and of course, centre. So he's well used to that sort of situation. The biggest game of ping pong ever. But uh, England will be penalised for crossing, and that is a harsh decision. Pretty big moment this, sir. A penalty for free. We haven't really worked for it. All we've done is play ping pong and, and wait for them to make a mistake. They've made a mistake from an offside's point of view, which is, you know, it's just an issue. So now the decision is, has the two-step Monty got enough legs in those um, skinny pins to get it from there? But, you know, I'd, I'd played with him for so long, I knew that 10 yards was pretty much what he had. Um, maybe 10 yards in the middle. And then I went up to this 19-year-old kid and I said, Francie, you know, obviously in Afrikaans, and we've got this word in, in, in Afrikaans, which is lighty, and it literally means lightweight, but it's lighty, spelt in, uh, in, a, in a very different way. And I said, lighty, how about a crack at three points? And he said, why not? This was a significant moment. From here, yeah, from here we, had a, we, had, we were going to make it even uglier. So. The deficit of eight points is, if, is an unbelievably hard barrier mentally to, to get through, especially when you haven't been able to score a try just yet. So this eight-point barrier meant that we could really close the taps, uh, you know, introduce a far bigger defensive uh, plan, and really just make sure that we spend as little time in our 22 as possible. So I mean, I still remember running back saying, guys, they can't score against us, so let's make sure that we play clever. Seven. Martin Corey goes uh, crashing into Scott Berger, chasing that ball. And England on the attack, straight after the restart. A little slip there from uh, Hipkiss, I think it was. Maybe Cueto. But Gummersall to Wilkinson. Back to Matthew Tate, who's getting more and more involved from the fullback position. Corey, a quick one to Saki, who goes inside. Around a couple of plays, but a good tackle there by Jacques Ferry. Been quite high around Paul Saki. So Paul Saki back on his feet. Wilkinson once more misses that Shaw. On to Hipkiss. Hipkiss in support on the far side. So this was good for us. I mean, they were going from side to side looking for 
something, looking for a line break and the defense. And what it helped is just keep our width. So all we had to do was keep at it, keep them make, from getting over the, the, the gain line. Still in possession, just. Scott Berger trying to get his hands on the ball, but the referee was saying, hands off. See back, four! Towards Shooter, lays it back to Gummersall, Wilkinson. A little uh, jinking run of his, which uh, sometimes can be all too predictable. I'll never forget, Farid Dupria was continually calling out, no penalties, no mistakes, no penalties, keep the discipline. Because that's the only thing that really could have you know, changed the way we played, was them getting back to six points and being within a try away. And then you have moments like that. Well, it looks as though South Africa have turned it over. Three human plows coming in. And that turn turnover reiterated how we were going to approach the next 20 minutes with an eight-point game. And uh, all of that attacking by England comes to naught, and that has dampened the spirits of the spectators here in the Stade de France. I'm not too sound as if I'm putting down the opponent, but they'd had a very disjointed build-up to the World Cup, and so, and as I mentioned earlier, it takes the hardest thing to become good at. It takes the most time uh, to have a, a well-oiled attack, and you know we we believed that our defence had enough to handle their attack. Um, and so when they started going lateral, side to side lateral and it just allowed us for our defence to comfortably readjust, it, it was crazy. It's one of the few games where we got energy out of defending effectively. Because every time they went through four or five phases, never made any yards, we would be patting each other on the back, even without having gotten the ball back. Delalio, can he become England's saving grace? He has a real impact player, and they certainly need points on the board. The difficulty within where you are now is that I didn't even notice Mark Regan going off because we're so focused on what what we're trying to do to keep this eight-point deficit that you know I, I lost track of the fact that they were making substitutions. To be fair, that's a big kick downfield. My goodness, Mark Cueto couldn't quite get hold of it. Well, interesting contrast in the, in the coaches. Brian Ashton bringing on fresh legs, bringing on impact players. Springbok bench have been up warming, warming up, but only 15 minutes to play. It's sometimes quite difficult to get into match with, un, in, with only 15 minutes to go. Jake wasn't going to make substitution unless we had some injuries. The only change to this team was he brought Vickers van Heden in for Bob Skinstead because Bob Skinstead he used as an impact player. But he didn't want to have impact players. He wanted the team to stay at the distance. And if we lost someone like a Skulk or a, he wanted a workhorse rather than someone that was going to come and set the stage alight, as you can imagine, because of the kind of tactics that we employed for the final. So a player like Bob was going to be a, a waste um, in terms of how we were going to play, which is why Vickers made cracked the nod for the um, 23 rather than Bob. It would be not uncommon for us to change how we played against the, the different teams. So, um, but w w without uh, beating around the bush, we were a team that was very efficient. We had, th we had three unbelievable tactical kickers, a nine, a 10, and a 15. So we honestly made it very difficult. We, our aerial skills were good. We kicked, very, we kicked very well. A nine that kicked on the button all the time. And we had a big pack of forwards that could make big hits. So this World Cup really was about us forcing people to try and attack in uncomfortable positions and creating turnovers. And those turnovers you know, turned Brian into the highest try scorer at the tournament. So it, um, it wasn't the kind of rugby you see today, but at the time, it was the kind of rugby that teams struggled to adapt to. We were, I guess in essence, we were the equivalent of a python that manages to get a grip on an, a prey. And every single time the prey tries to move, we sort of just tightened a little bit more. And every time they try to move again, we would tighten a little bit more. And that was our analogy for this World Cup final. So, oh my goodness. Now then. Well, I think it's going to the bin. I think it's going to the bin. Let's have a look. I'll probably get away with it. Captain's grace. It's <laughs> such a blatant foul, that. So 
Wilkinson cleans up for England. That's just inside, or is it? Yes, it is. Unlucky. And off the hook. Not even a replay. Oh. Are you joking? Well, it wasn't Victor Manfield at all. Innocent. We had, we had a really good day at the office when it came to the line-outs, and I can only imagine how horrible it must have been to be the, the opposing hooker. Because the one thing about us is that we wanted people in the air all the time, and when you've got people in the air, you've got traffic, and it just clouds your ability to see your target. Going back to that line-out, a crucial line-out for England to win five yards out, and South Africa turned it over. Well, they've done that a few times, particularly in the first half. So George Shooter, right to the back to Simon Shaw, laid it back eventually, and uh, good drive there. Hands off now, hands just off! Coming out a little bit scrappily. Matthew Stevens takes it. He's actually pushed backwards. The man who was born in Durban in South Africa but now plays for England. Gamasol waits and looks for options. Delalio stands away. The last thing about this is if you're, if you're sitting as a coach of, of South Africa, you know, when a nine's looking up and he's looking and he's not sure which way to pass to or which first pod to play, you sort of get an idea of the kind of attack that they had for the day. Everything took a little bit longer, so every single time they decided which way to play, we had an extra second or two to adjust our defence. Hands out, 18! Stay out of it! 18, don't come across! Butch James, who's been absolutely rock-solid for South Africa here this evening. 70 minutes gone, and it's South Africa who's got a significant lead at the moment. 15 points to six. Wow, well, brilliant play by Montgomery. Paul, there are more changes on the England bench. You've got um, Peter Richards, who's just about to come on, so I can imagine that Andy Gomesall will be the man coming off. Yes, Andy Gomesall, who... Uh, his career, really, a couple of years well, ago, it, was dead and buried. It's not, actually. It's Joe Worsley, who is clutching his hamstring. So, you know, they've had to replace a flanker with a scrum half. Now, You're it's just to right. see what they have to... I think Richards will have to just in the back. Listen, what the hell do I do? At no stage in the 70 minutes, you know, did we feel as if we were in trouble and and I guess there was a quiet confidence that had, been, that had built am amongst us over the seven week period and you know we had this we had this I guess the fallback of should something happen we've got the ability to fix it but for now it's working their attacks not getting through the defense the defense is giving us energy and we're not allowing Johnny into a situation where he can get penalties and drop kicks so it is a very unlikely position to be in, where you, if we look at the territory up until now, honestly, England would be very, very, very much better off than we are. But, yeah, there was never a time where we came together as the leadership in the team and said, sure, this is not working, we need to get out of the half, we need to start carrying the ball more. It just, we had a plan. We were going to get to that eight-point marker and we were going to make sure that we didn't allow England any sort of opportunity to get a breakaway or a runaway or something. The former South African captain and uh, another tremendous jump by Victor Madfield. My goodness, he's been such a tower in that line-out. Well, I think they stole that brilliantly. Wilkinson hoists again. Certainly a lot of kicks, high kicks being put in by the England team. Good pick up there by Ben Kay to Simon Shaw, his second row teammate. I think this is where my eye pops up here. Drop goal attempt by Wilkinson off the right foot. He can't repeat what he did in Australia four years ago. Uh, they need tries, they need tries, they should have moved it. 
was a per bit of decision making uh, well, by the usually rock solid Johnny Wilkinson. Yeah, also a good sign. Because they need to get the, they need to buffer the eight points. They need to get it around that. Yeah, they got to get two within a, a scoring tries you know, point of view. Two splits. I need a blood replacement. Time out, please, George. Yes, yes. Okay, I need a replacement hooker on, please. He needs to be stitched there. Thank you. Like this, honestly, was the most stressful time. Running off the field here, knowing full well that uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> but the most bizarre thing happened here. So I sort of calmly walked off the field. I thought, you know, I don't want to rush off the field. But once I got off the field, I wanted to get into the, into the office. And I also knew that Busy, an incredible player, he was being put under huge pressure. I mean, he was in his first international season. And he'd, he'd been a late call up into the World Stuart, Cup, so on, you know, and the lineouts had gone really well. So you know, and this guy cracked it. He got one lineout, I think, on his line, and he, you That's know, he hit it spot on. So as I got into the tunnel, I had these three French doctors almost attack me, and they raced me down there. They said, "Allez, allez, allez!" And um, before I could knew, I had like this guy was stitching me. It didn't even clean my wound. No local anaesthetic, nothing. These Frenchies were more passionate about getting me back on the field than I think anyone in South Africa was. And it was so eerie because inside it's completely soundproof. You can't hear a thing. You can't hear the crowds. And if the crowds were loud, it means England was doing well. And if the crowds were quiet, and it means that everything was as it was. But I couldn't hear anything. So I, I, wasn't, I wasn't protesting having my eye you know, stitched up without anything being cleaned or without any local anesthetic. And it must have been the fastest seven stitches in the history of, of, of rugby medicine because they did end up popping uh, for the next three months of my, of my career. Conjure up from here. Gamasalt looks out wide to Wilkinson. Wilkinson's got a couple of men outside him, but decides to chip through. Good kick. It is a good kick. This is Bismarck's moment. Interestingly enough, you know, he's a young hooker. Uh, had, you would normally think that the opposition hooker would have spent a, at least five or so seconds getting in his ear, sowing some doubt, asking him if he's nervous. You know, just a little bit of sledging, but you know, the guy got off scot free and he absolutely bangs it. And that number of lineouts lost there is uh, incredibly significant as far as the South Africans are concerned. They've controlled things at the lineout wonderfully. There's another well sorted bit of defensive work there by South Africa. It's an interesting clip. The guy sitting just in front of um, Jake, he was our security liaison, um, presented to us by obviously uh, the French for the World Cup. And this guy was an absolute legend. And uh, I'll never forget when we came back home to celebrate, Jake paid for his ticket to come and join in our celebrations around the country. by South Africa. Where's the ball, Lawrence Delalio is saying. I'm quite sure what was going on there. England number eight, but now England get themselves organised. Once again, right on this side, here is the main stand here. Paul Saki is standing out wide, but South Africa have turned it over. That's a, a huge number of turnovers that South Africa have had, but well kept in by Mark Cueto, who almost scored a try for England. That is uh, consigned to the history books now, though. Over the halfway line, Matthew Tate spins it wide to Toby Flood. He's got Paul Saki outside him. Saki's chasing it. So, so close. Well taken by Jacques Ferry. Great cover defence by the centre. Puts James acting as scrum half, sends it back to his scrum half to Fury Dupree. Matthew Tate once more is underneath it. Mark Cueto 
He's got some pace, Cueto. Didn't really use it on that occasion. No, a little bit indecisive there. England still have possession. Wilkinson. Not taking it at pace, though, was Tate, so easily tackled by Puri. South African centre gets back to his feet very quickly. Little driving run there by Matt Stevens. Gamasol to Flood, now to Lawrence Delalio. To Tate. Tate absolutely hit hard there by JP Peterson. It feels like a lifetime for me because I'm not on the field yet. It's such a nervous feeling because I'm running out of time and all I want to see is the scoreboard because I just want to see that the score is exactly as it was. Um, so I had two moments of relief. The one's still coming when the final whistle goes, but this was the first moment of relief when I came out and the game was exactly the same. The score hadn't changed. There's no way through this South African defence. Defence absolutely solid and Shooter hanging onto the ball, surely. <laughs> this was scripted, you know, in terms of let them come all day, entrust the D, keep the width. Jacques Free never stopped talking. It was just one of those things where it was one of the few games where defending against the team was going to give us energy. Whereas you defend against a team like New Zealand or Australia, they've got an incredible attack that's going to, going to open up holes and, and ask questions of your defence no matter how good you are. But we made a decision that our defence was strong enough to handle this attack. And so when it did handle the attack, it gave us energy. And um, that turnover, obviously, put a lot of confidence into us. All we had to really do was manage the clock for three minutes. I don't remember what comes next, but if I know myself and this team, I'm almost certain this will be a drive and everything we do will be kept quite close to try and get through the phases. But uh, let me see, let me see how well I know myself. So what do you think happens now? Pick and go, <laughs> pop pass. Nothing more than two passes at any time. The irony about this is that at, if two months before, the Sharks had lost to the Bulls in the Super Rugby Final and we had had the worst game management towards the end. And so we actually discussed this between the leadership of the Sharks guys that lost the final and the Bulls guys in terms of how we would grind out moments like this because of how we got it wrong in the final, which ended up costing us the trophy. They're trying to finish with a flourish here. We're came, coming up to the last two minutes. Well, Percy Montgomery is sitting in the pocket there. Well, he'd love to uh, get a drop goal in this World Cup final. Uh, it'd be a real long-range effort, that's for sure. We were in a good position. A turnover here still meant that they had to you know, cover 60, 60 metres and score a try and convert it and go back and get a kick. So right now, yeah, it was really about game management and keeping out of our 22. So I can tell you right now, CJ Falinda was not, <laughs> was not so at all. But as we went down there, I just said to him, you know, buy an extra 20 seconds, you know, because you can't get going without a, a prop. So, Everything about this last three, four minutes was a manipulation of the clock. And, uh, and so we didn't get the result out of the, out of the drive. Um, you know, purely from a, it's a difficult call to make for a referee to penalise a drive there. You know? So um, it was really about us winding the clock down. I think the crowds have also realised that there's a, there's a minute and a half left and there's more than eight points difference. CJ has wasted about half a metre of head tape to try and secure a, a William Wibillis trophy in the Republic of South Africa. But the pain will have disappeared amongst the euphoria sure, time of becoming world Here's champions closer, in just over a minute Touch. and a half's time. Touch, pause, again. Gamasaw for England. We haven't even mentioned man of the match yet, David. Any ideas? Well, I... I find it hard to go beyond Percy Montgomery, to be honest. Well, it wouldn't be the first time he's had man of the match in the World Cup. 
All we needed was the lad. A quick throw in was not what we needed. Less than one minute to go. South Africa destined to become the world champions. Full celebration. Ellen wanting one more throw of the dice. An almost out of camera shot there. A little smile on the face of the old campaigner, Oz Durant. No penalties. Well, it's been an incredible story for Oz Durant, and I think. Uh, well, looking at the time, I think it's keep possession and put the ball into touch. One can presume that we're probably not going to go wide from here. And poor old Ellen. Yes, yes. He gets the big ginger beer hugging him. You know, I, 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 I think about this moment and I get asked about this moment all the time. And it, it, for everyone, I'm sure it was an exciting and a happy moment. But I, honestly, all I could feel was a relief, as if the weight of the world had, had come off our shoulders. Um, a four-year journey, you know, a year before, nearly all of us being fired after losing five in a row, and then being able to get there and do the business for the seven weeks and, and bring the trophy. So, mine was just this, this absolute sense of relief, and I, and I always, you know, I talk about the. There's a Thursday night, and I couldn't sleep, and my wife was there, and I was tossing and turning, and eventually she said, "What's the story? You know, you got to sleep." And I said, oh, "What happens if we don't win this thing? What happens if we come second, and all this is for nothing?" And she said in her glory, she said, Look, if you worry about coming second, you'll forget about coming first. And that was really our approach. We just, we did what we thought was necessary for us to be able to win this game. And um, it was a little different to how we'd approached other games in the pool stages, but we took a calculated bet that how we were gonna approach this game would give us a very conservative way of winning this trophy. Yeah, I think that there those moments which are quite special are the ones where you now start to embrace all your teammates and this four-year journey where you've gone from being opposition locally to teammates to almost a family where you've started, you know, getting to know the wives who become, uh, the girlfriends who become wives, who become um, mothers and their guys. As if we've just, we've shared a special four years together. So these moments are probably where you really, for the first time, get to understand what the four years stood for and what, and what all the sacrifices were about. And, um, and then you start sort of circling around the stadium and you just see you know, that happiness. The one thing that, you know, that stood out for me was the, was the emotion of Jake. You know, I, I, was, I was worried about Jake because he'd thrown you know, his entire existence into this, into this group for four years. And um, I, mean, I wasn't sure that he could recover from something like this if we hadn't come through. So his emotion just made it a lot more special in terms of the magnanimity of what this actually meant. And we just thought it was about us and, and what we'd gone through. And the, you asked the question in terms of when did this really sink in. It sunk in when we got home. We got to an airport in Oliver Tambo and there was literally thousands of South Africans, the airport was a mess, no one could move. Thousands of South Africans from all walks of life, just to get a glimpse of a Brian Abana or a Percy Montgomery, and just to, sh to clap hands and, and scream. And, and we thought it would end there, and then as we moved across the country in this bus, thousands of South Africans from all walks of life, those that have got, those that don't have, chasing after a bus, trying to take pictures. And for, for three days, we got a, our first taste of actually what we had achieved and it was a lot bigger than what we, what we thought it was which was winning a World Cup for a team. It really was something we didn't know and it was the, the sort of power of bringing hope back to a, to a nation that, that needed some good news. John congratulations, you're the 2007 world champions, how does it feel? Uh, try not to cry but it's amazing. Uh, I wonder if four years of 50 people's lives can finish that little cup but it has been worth every single second, and uh, we had 45 odd million South Africans, and I think the rest of the world shouting for us tonight. And it was a colossal game, but to be able to win a World Cup 
I think I'll only realise it in, in a couple of days' time. They gave you a good run for your money, though, didn't they, the English tonight? Well, they're a completely different side and tonight. It really was anyone's game. They played technically really well. We had to field some big kicks in the first half and that made life pretty difficult. But you know what? I would have taken 3 0 at the end of the day if someone had let me sign a contract. Thanks so much, John. Congratulations once again. Have a great evening and uh, have a great party. Thank you very much. You will do. Giving thanks was always a big, a big part of this group. And there was a huge amount of spirituality around this campaign. And, and it played a big role in our, in our campaign, this sort of spirituality. So um, it was without fail how we started every test and how we ended every test. And um, I was proud of, of many things, obviously proud to have won the World Cup, but I was, I was proud of how this group conducted itself then, 10 years ago, and still how it st remains together. And we joke about the WhatsApp group, but uh, this is a, a pretty unique group of guys who've, who've remained as tight today as they were 10 years ago. And, and I think that's a testament to how we conducted ourselves then and how they've continued to conduct themselves as people, part of a pretty special group, even now. Quite a nerve-wracking time as well because it sort of hasn't quite set in yet, you know, and you're still trying to just verify that this has all happened. Your worst fear is that your alarm goes off and it's actually Saturday morning and this is all going to start again. Well, you thought the atmosphere during the game was electric. Just listen to the crowd now. Had to go in for the hug. Look how happy he is. He's as happy as we are. It is the moment of a lifetime. It's one of those moments where it can't go slow enough because you just, you know, when will you get another moment in time that will stand up to this kind of feeling? And so just to be out there on the field and allow this moment to unfold and be there for as long as possible. We literally could have camped and started front safe for the night. It's pretty awesome to watch it again and I'm glad I haven't watched it for the last 10 years because, you know, having watched it, it sort of brings back all those memories about what this group meant to each other and, and the effect that it had on our, on our country. At the time we didn't know it enough but we were part of a generation and an era of rugby player at a time when South Africa needed it. Very much like 95, you know, almost a fairy tale. And 12 years later, countries sort of developed as a democracy. It, it was the right time for South Africa to have some more good news. And, and on, on cue, this sort of Springbok rugby team delivered for South Africa again. Um, people won't understand, and we didn't understand it until a few days later, but they'll never understand the kind of impact this has on our society, 50 odd million people. Sport has probably been one of the biggest factors in our country in terms of reuniting all different sizes, shapes and colours and uh, this helped South Africa an incredible amount. This guy orchestrated a four year plan that was well thought out a genius in selection of players, amazing at analysis and tactics, just you know, incredible at uh, unraveling teams' game plans, and uh, gave us a platform to be able to become great players. We weren't a great team when we got given Jake as a coach. We'd been knocked out, embarrassed in a quarterfinal, and Jake came in as an unknown coach on the international scene and produced a plan that turned us into world champions. It's funny, this moment you'd think would be so enjoyable, but I, I couldn't get this over with fast enough. I wanted to just grab the trophy and get behind the team as fast as possible because you think about the whole four year journey that requires so many people to sacrifice and then it's one guy holding the trophy up. So it didn't seem like the fitting way to end it. So 
I couldn't get to the team fast enough. And this is the moment that John Smith will just feel on top of the world. The old two hands is just too cliche. And I had the president of South Africa holding my hand. I mean, flip, it was a privilege. So I had to mix it up a bit. The crazy thing about that night is that we all went back to the hotel and sat with our wives and girlfriends and fathers and friends in the team room until 4 o'clock in the morning, drinking the France's finest beer and champagne out of that cup. Everyone just wanted to be able to make that moment last as long as possible. And um, I, don't, I don't think there was a man amongst us that wanted to go out and celebrate in town. It still doesn't seem real. It still doesn't seem real, but I'm pretty glad it happened.